hello and good evening to Behind the Mic Radio. I am your host, Dawn Mack, and it is Friday Eve, and I love me some Friday Eve because the weekend is upon us, and uh, I hope that uh, you are looking forward to it as much as I am. And I'm especially excited about tonight because our guest, oh, so much to say about our guest. Our guest this evening is a writer, a humorist, and the older brother of legendary comedian George Carlin. He was he has written for television shows including Sick of the Night and the George Carlin Show, and he created a radio show, Weekly Chunk of News Roundup, and has been a frequent guest on the WDST Radio Morning Show. He is the author of Highway 23, The Unrepentant, and his latest release, Kian Effin Sabe. Uh, his amazing life has taken him to the United States Air Force, to the Ed Sullivan Show and the Gong Show, the comedy stage and beyond. It is with great honor and pleasure to welcome Patrick Carlin. Hello, Patrick. How you doing, Dawn? I am wonderful. How are you? Well, thank you for that nice intro. It, it does sum up a lot of my life. It's been uh, like a bouncing ball and nothing but fun. Uh, you know, and, and to be able to have a life where you can say it's been nothing but fun has been quite the life. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. It's all about remembering the good stuff. That's the, <laughs> that's the secret. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. Now, you are so dynamic and interesting that it's hard to know where to start. But let, I'd like to start by talking about your humble beginnings, if you will, and um it's no secret you come from a family that made humor a part of everyday life. I mean, there's you and, of course, George and, and now his daughter Kelly. And somehow I get the feeling it was part of your DNA somewhere along the way. I do believe that, Dawn. I genuinely believe that uh, there's something in persons that, you know, there's a corny old – I love corny stuff because it's true. Uh, and it's two men looking through the, through the bars – one saw mud and the other saw stars. And it, it's that simple. You know, I was always the guy, mm-hmm. you give me a little bag of pony droppings, and uh, I'm looking for that horse, man. I know yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, you, it, really is about, it really is about the glass half empty, the glass half full. You know, it's really oh, all yeah. how you look at life, you know? Good for you. Good for you, Dawn. No, that's the secret, <laughs> man. And it's a half a glass of something, so drink it down and worry about, that's you right. know. I mean, as long as, yeah. you got a half, as long as you've got a half a glass, you're doing great. You know, that's oh, the way yeah. I view life. I mean, that doesn't mean it's always going to be rosy, but no. you, know, if you can look at life in such a in a positive way. It, it tends to make life a little bit better along the way. And, you know, yeah. So. Oh yeah. And if it's your <laughs> if it's your if it's your natural mode, yes, because uh, you mentioned you just, you know you said like humble beginnings, and I got a kick out of that because I was born in 1931. And that was the October 31 was the height of the Depression, and people were, you know, getting blown from Arkansas all the way out to California, looking for things that happened, banks going under, everything. And I was a rich kid. I was a rich kid, man, because my father made a lot of money. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you know, everything comes with a tag. The guy was an alcoholic, and he was weirded out. And uh, so that was exciting. And we split. My mother turned her back on that stuff when George was two months old. And wow. she said, that ain't it, man. He's not going to, you know. And boom, we were out of there. And George was on the road at two months old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it was, yeah. And it was never tough, you know. I mean, bread was 11 cents. And he was born in 1937. And we were living up at 140th in New York. And bread was 11 cents. A quart of milk was 11 cents. You know, your mom could send you to the store with uh, two bucks. And you come back with a couple of big bags of the yeah. A food. Yeah. Life was okay. Uh, yeah. Why, and to, to think if we could just pay a fraction of that, what we pay for bread and milk nowadays, you know, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all relative. I was reading today how thirty-five grand a year is tough to live on in New York oh, City. Yeah. In New mm-hmm. York City. Yeah. And, you know, back in the old days, you know, I hate to say the old days, but uh, they, every, the reason that the old days are the old days and the reason that the old days sound good to people is because you got through them alive. That's mm-hmm. basically what happened. So you made it through that, and that's cool. And the other stuff is scary to you. But I've never found it that way. I just relax and hang on, and and off you go, you know. And you need a, you need 
we're going to be married for 56 years on the 20th of April, and you need a you need a wife that is ready to go down the trail with you. And uh, luckily enough, uh, that's what I got, Marlene. Ah, uh, congratulations on 50 years of wedded bliss, and uh, and you know and. And that is such an accomplishment, especially today with with marriages breaking up left and right. And I'm always happy to hear when someone can say, you know, me and me and my spouse have been married, you know, 50 years, 40 years. I mean, uh, heck, 20 years nowadays is a long time. So oh it's, yeah, it's, it's such a major accomplishment. And uh, and congratulations to you and your bride. Oh, thank you. I tell you the funny thing, like back, you'd be out when we were in California, and you know, all I was a car salesman, and various things I did. And you'd be talking with some guy, and he'd say, uh, so how long have you been married, Patrick? And I'd say, oh, you know, 17 years, man. And he'd say, wow, same woman? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they bounce around. And I got I got good buddies that have been down the trail to it. Sometimes it takes you three or four times, you know, to find the right one. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, so everything everything fits a different seat. Yeah, and when you can find one that you've been with for 50 years, you know you found the right one. You were doing yeah. something right from the very get-go, you know. <laughs> you, you lucked out. That's right. That's it's right. That's right. That's right. But, now, your background is so unbelievable. I mean, you've accomplished much. I mean, it's, it's almost like what haven't you done? Because as I read about you and I've studied about you, it's like, oh, wow, you know, he's done this. Oh, he's done this. And, and you know, it's like, well, what has he not done? But who do you credit as being some of your biggest influences? Um, I really don't know uh, what my influence were, except well, one big thing was when I changed from being a conservative uh, to a freak in 1966. That was uh, Bob Dylan and the Beatles. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and Reefer, is that okay to say? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, because uh, Reefer uh, really set me free, Dawn. I was uh, I was floating along. George came west in 1966, you know, and he mm-hmm. had a he had a gig out there with the John Davidson show, and uh, he was writing and he was a hippy dippy weatherman. All and he had he I hadn't done anything. I had quit drinking alcohol in 1964 because I found out that uh, I was Irish and I was running out of bail money. So, uh, you know, I said, well, that's time to quit that. So I quit doing yeah. it. And then after two years of doing nothing, he comes back there with reefer, which I had only bumped into now and then with alcohol in my system, which does not give the weed a fair chance to do its mental trip. And, uh, uh, oh, really, I have found this out. And I don't, I don't call it research. I just call it facts of life from Patrick. And uh, uh, that's, it's, yeah, you know, my case history was, I drank from 15 till 33. That's 18 years that alcohol was my scene. And yeah. uh, guys have written stuff about that, like Pete Hamill wrote a thing, a book called, you know, The Drinking Years and all. And you're in an Irish neighborhood, and there's plenty of saloons around. And uh, that's just like a way of life. And when you get away from alcohol, it becomes a different scene. But I got to tell mm-hmm. you, I went two years from 64 to 66 without drinking, and I was still not Mr. Cool. I still had my bad temper and stuff. And then when George came out and I started smoking with him and listening to Dylan and the, and then one day I was looking to join the John Birch Society, Dawn. Wow. I was looking, yeah, man, I had voted for Barry Goldwater. And he comes out there and I'm smoking with him and I'm hearing Bob Dylan saying, you know, you got a lot of nerve to call yourself my friend. And I'm saying, wow. And I, finally one day I said, <laughs> I said to George, I said, I said that dude is singing about me, man. And I, uh, <laughs> it was like flipping a coin to the other side. I just became Joe Freakarino, and uh, you know I still smoke reefer. And uh, I, you know that book Highway Twenty Three that you mentioned. Yes. Well, I wrote that. I started writing that way back in nineteen ninety or something like that. And a guy threw me a big bud. He repaired a furnace there, and he said, smoke this, Patrick. And I said, okay, cool. And I did, and the next thing I know, I wrote eight. I started remembering about fun, you know, being stationed in Michigan 40 years before that. And it just comes back, I mean, Roger and all that Air Force talk. 
it was amazing. I had eight pages of yellow sheets filled, and I was often winging on what I call pulp romance dawn. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, if you haven't read it, uh, it won't be at your library, <laughs> but maybe you can find it at, at Amazon or something because it's not the one I just wrote, but it's one that's full of music. And a guy from Irish America magazine, uh, Tom Dagnan, back in 07, he called it an historical novel, A Note. It's a, about it's that. A, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like being there. It's like riding in that 1951 Chevrolet on Route 66, listening to Kitty Wells sing her first song, It Wasn't God Who Made Honky Tonk Angels, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, those are memories that you don't erase. And Reefer seems to bring that back for me. And it's it's just uh, it, it's what causes these notes. I write these notes. It's how Kien Blank and Sabe uh, came to be a book, also because after George died in two thousand and eight, mm-hmm. you know you feel. I mean, it's your brother, and I yeah. seventy one years we were together, and I mean we talked on the phone like at least a couple of times a week, and we were both music freaks. I mean, stone music freaks, man, and uh, I still come across things and say boy i'd like to send that to him you know that tune yeah and he would send the tunes to me and uh i mean country music and rhythm and blues mostly country and rhythm Mm -hmm. and blues oh wow and uh and we loved it like we used to when way back before we either of us came to california we had 45 rpms and i had one by james moody doing I'm in the Mood for Love, and then King mm-hmm. Pleasure singing word for word to it. And we'd play one after the other, and the guy would do the saxophone thing, and the other guy come in and say, James Moody, you can make a blow now if you want to. We're true. And, I mean, <laughs> we, well, we just loved that music so much. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big influence on me. Oh, for sure, for sure. Now, now, Highway 23 was your first novel, and oh yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know it, it really is no surprise that you dedicated your first novel to George, and, and that was pretty much a no brainer, I'm sure, right? Oh yeah, it was like stealing. <laughs> it was so <laughs> it was so easy. I felt like I was cheating. It was so easy to come up with dialogue and just transpose characters and just give them different names, but you know, have them saying the stuff they said to you, you know. I mean, I remember when uh, I had a I had a commanding officer in Michigan and I was an eight ball. I'd already been busted once or twice for various things, usually alcohol inspired. And you got your time off. And he gets me, I, uh, he decides he's going to show me how, he says, I'm going to motivate you, Carlin. I'm going to start giving <laughs> you stripes, you know. And I didn't care about stripes. I never cared about getting a 100 on my homework. I never cared about a little gold star on my paper. And I certainly don't care what this captain thinks of me because I got things to do in town. And he says, I'm going to give you stripes. So, the day that he uh, got me going up for corporal or what they call in the Air Force, Airman Second, I'm in town having a fight with the deputy, and I wind up doing 10 days in jail. <laughs> the guy comes unglued, you know. And so when I come back, he made me feel so good because I was about 19 at the time. And, you know, they get in front of your face like on McHale's Navy and stuff like that. Rah, 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 rah. And this yeah. is supposed, you know, and I'm, I didn't care. And he says, Carlin, there are so many things that I hate about you. I don't know where to begin. But the oh, thing well. I hate the thing I hate worst is your I don't give a blank attitude, you know? And oh, yeah. I thought to myself, man, this guy finally understands I do not give a blank, man. So forget it. And uh I was good at my job, but I had my off duty time was fun. And mm-hmm. uh yeah, and those are things that you have to recognize. If you treat me right, I can work like a champ for you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that kind of goes across the board with anyone. I mean, I think that's really what it's all about, you know. It's it is. Morale and, and building people up, and you, you'll be surprised at the results you'll get when you do that. Absolutely, Dawn. And you know what you can do? You can learn from your own life. You can mm-hmm. learn from your own life when, in our travels, like you said, we bounced around here in Aeronol. When we got back from Trinidad and Tobago, we went to work in a, 
a school up in Vermont for rich kids that weren't living up to mom and dad's expectations, you know, got caught smoking yeah. dope or something like that in prep school right. or joy rode a car. And these kids hated the kitchen when we came in. They hated it. But they used to call the boys kitchen queens and stuff like that if they were on kitchen duty. And they made it, and it was an odious thing. And then they didn't get any food after dinner. And you know these kids, are, they're sent up there for smoking reefer. So what, are they going to mm-hmm. quit smoking it? Yeah, and you know right. how they... Yeah, how they like to eat after dinner. So we just gave them chow to take to the dorms, like peanut butter and stuff. And these kids would be like volunteering for KP. So if you're not <laughs> liking the way you're treated when when you're a KP in the service, then you get to be a person who administers those KP duties. Don't do it the way that you resented it. Do it the way you would have liked to have been treated. And these kids... exactly. It was a, you, it was what you said, Dawn. It was how you treat people, and how, you know you could be in the break room and have one staff sergeant come in and say, "All right, off your butts, we will clean this." Oh, yeah. And I'd take the mop, and you'd get a certain mop job out of me with that with that kind of a thing. You'd know <laughs> that the mop hit the floor, <laughs> but that was all you would know. Whereas another yeah. guy, yeah, another guy slides in and says, hey, listen, the inspector general's coming today, Patrick, and we're in deep blank. Can you can you help it? Don't worry about a thing, Jim. And that's that's all about how you present it, man. And that's life. It really is. That is. That, yeah. that will serve you well throughout life. And, and, and one of the, I've always believed that one of the key secrets to life is how you treat others. And, and what you give back. Is, is, you know, pretty much I think it comes back to you in a lot of ways. And and definitely if you treat someone well, you're going to get treated well in return. It, it really does work hand in hand, I believe. Absolutely. My mother was a champ at that. And uh, she was full of humor, and so was my father. And then naturally George was funny, and I look at the funny things funny ways. And all our uncles <laughs> were cool. They were cool guys, too. But she was an executive secretary, and she could size people up. And her boss, the president of this big advertising association, would rely on her. But, again, it was realism that she picked up at a young age from hanging with the other girls and growing up in New York City and paying attention, Dawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I think that is so key because uh, being tuned in to other people and what they're saying and really making them feel like you care about them, not just what they're doing, but them as as human beings. I mean, that, that that can go so much farther than anything else you could do. You know. Oh yeah, I see it <laughs> every day. I love it. That's why I stay now, relaxed. I read somewhere that you have been often referred to as the dude of dudes and the ace of aces. And how did you acquire such monikers? I love it. Oh, that's funny. I'll tell you. Uh, it was George got out of eighth grade in 1951, and I got some kind of a leave from the Air Force and came home. And my mother was after him to go to Regis High School, which is where you go if you want to bring like six books home with you and never go out and see your friends and then, you yeah. know, get a scholarship somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And this Thanks. kid was, he was not into that any more than I'd been into that, man. And so I wrote, they have a little eighth grade book that you sign, like an autograph book. You know, the girl writes, this is the girl who sat next to you, Georgie. (laughs) And uh, so he wanted me me to sign his book, and I signed. I said, uh, don't go to Regis. Go to Hayes and be cool. And, And I signed it, the ace of aces and the dude of dudes, your brother, Patrick. So that's, that's where that came from. And, uh, I just, I always had high self-esteem, and I told George what that, I said, listen, man, they they were saying something about self-esteem, and I said, listen, man, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I always had high self-esteem from the time I was a tiny dude, George, and he said, yeah, he said, most psychopaths do, <laughs> and I just. I loved it, man. I would love when he would tell me stuff like that, you know, and because he knew from a young age that I was a bent tool, and but he thought that was cool, and for me just to be as I was. So when he wrote his book, uh, Last Words, with uh, with.
with, uh, oh, my God, good buddy of mine, uh, uh, Tony, Tony Hendra. Uh, what a thing to get a name blank on Tony. But anyway, he wrote this last words with Tony Hendra, and it was his autobiography, and he entitled one chapter there, The Ace of Aces and the Dude of Dudes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he signed brain droppings. I was looking at it this morning because I must mention something about brain droppings. And I said, I better look at what he wrote in mine. And I came to the, I, I came to the, he dedicated the book to me, brain droppings. He said, this book is dedicated to my big, my big brother, Patrick, who was kind enough to teach me attitude. <laughs> yeah. So I looked up here and it says, it says for Patrick. The dude of dudes, mine brud, M E I N B R U D, you know. And then uh-huh. under that he writes, Hey Patrick, these are rare now. Don't give it away. And he signed it, The Ace of Aces. George oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we had fun with with stuff like that, and uh, I don't think we ever took anything very seriously you know george never got off the corner it was never ever an embarrassment to be with this guy you know like you're with some people that are known a little or this or that and they get like an attitude about them of like they're mm-hmm. actually important or something and do you know who yeah. i am do you know who i am whoa yeah. you know you want to crawl in a hole i was out with a guy once going to uh, on a business trip with him and he actually snapped his fingers for a waitress, okay? Mm. And you know what I mean? I'm shrinking down. Oh, yeah. like I'm, I'm trying to become a microbe, uh, like an unseen. But, yeah. you know, some some people just don't know how to be plain. And George knew how to just be George. And it was just always a pleasure to be anywhere with that guy. Uh. Well, you know, when, when I would see him, you know, on television or on a special and – he was on stage and everything, even though this was all, you know, part of his act, he was so believable. You could believe that if he came off the stage, he would have the same sarcastic wit and humor that you saw on stage. It, I mean, you just felt like that George Carlin was not just, he wasn't just putting up on the stage of, of what he did and what he loved. He was that way in real life, you know, and, uh, and you, I think that's why so many people loved him for, for that realness, you know, and that honesty and the blatant truth. You know, he told it like it was, you know. I, I and, do believe, I do believe that, that, that that's a quality that shows true. And it's, a, it's again, it's a thing that, that can't be faked, you know. You, you either no. are colorblind or you're not colorblind, and uh, that's it. And uh, he had that wonderful quality, and it never left him. And, and, you know, just wonderful, wonderful, relaxed way about him. Well, one of the things I wanted to um, ask you, I had, um, I know that his his final book, Last Words, it came out as an audio book, and you did the voice, the voice work on that. So how did that come about, and how difficult was that for you to do? Well, uh Number one, it was as easy as uh, walking out the front door. But number two, it came about uh, through my niece Kelly and through Tony Hendra. And they were originally going to have a bunch of different comics, I guess, each read a chapter or this or that. And uh, then uh, Tony and Kelly said, oh, no, let's just have Patrick read that. So I... uh, the to read it i just went up there to a studio where i used to do these little news things i would do like news stories and then end them up with a a song behind it or something and Mm -hmm. uh i was very at ease in that studio anyway and they sent a lady up uh, elisa shokoff from uh, simon and schuster and it's Mm -hmm. good she was there because i'm reading this thing like a champ and all of a sudden george has some kind of a french phrase in there (laughs) <laughs> and I said what? Uh, and I I said something with it. I forget what it was. And then uh, then Elisa laid it on me what it was. And then I went back and hit it. But other than that, I did like six hours one day and six and a half hours the next day. And that was Mister Book. There was none of this wow. take two, take three, or craparino because I was reading what he wrote about Mm -hmm. our family and how he got conceived and how we went here and how we went there. And it was the rhythm of his life, you know, and I was Mm -hmm. into it 
I was into it anyway, and uh, it was nice. I smoked a big one before <laughs> before each session, <laughs> so I was enjoying doing it. And uh, the goofy thing is, like, when we would talk to my mom on the phone or something, mm-hmm. it was, she would never know whether it was my me talking or George talking, and uh, we'd have to straighten her on that. And I noticed that a few times while I was reading George's trip that I almost was like listening to him say the words. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And that was spooky in a nice manner, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In a nice manner. I said, oh, wow, this is cool. And I just kept right on reading it, and it was a pleasure. And uh, they did a good job on that, Tony and George. Yeah. Well, I think that was was incredibly fitting that they, they said, you know, there was another no-brainer moment. I mean, you know, that you would do uh, the read on the audio book because um, the whole conglomeration of, of, of his peers in the industry that would have come together and gladly and graciously done that, it just seems perfect, you know, that you were the one that did it in the end. So um, kudos on that. I mean, I've um, I've not read that book, but I I want to, and I'm going oh, to. Oh, listen, um, get the audio. Get the audio one. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do I'll have to read the book and, and get the audio, you know, because, yeah. um, I mean, just just to hear you, um, it, it would be like the best of both where you just call it and call it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I love it. I really enjoyed it. You know, you're not supposed to say stuff about your own stuff, but I don't care because it, I enjoyed listening to that thing because sometimes I would really lose myself you know, listening to mm-hmm. it and mm-hmm. about you. It's just Wonderful family stuff and well written and uh, yeah, I'm so glad they chose me to do that. Really, Dawn. That, uh, oh, I'm so that, glad too. Now, what are some of your fondest memories, George? Oh, oh, wow! Uh, everything like uh, just being with them, uh, doing music. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny one. I'll tell you a funny one. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'm home on a leave. I'm home on a leave, and uh, I go down on 25th Street, and I see one of his buddies and all, and I'm having a nice time, and as I'm leaving the bar, he slips me a couple of joints. This is like probably around 1951 or something. And he says, uh, there you go, tell Georgie happy, you know, Merry Christmas. So I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I get up the house, and we smoke these two joints, Okay. Uh-huh. And he starts telling me, he just gets goofy, and he starts telling me weird stuff and making up crazy stuff, and he gets me laughing to where I'm actually on the living room floor. <laughs> and we'd, we'd be down there playing records anyway, and I'm on the floor, and I'm laughing. And my mother gets up. They slept in the far end of the house, my mother and my aunt. And she comes out in her bathrobe, and she says, Oh, it's so nice to see you boys enjoying each other. (laughs) Yeah, uh, smoke is everywhere and we're loaded. And we just started laughing even more, you know. uh, Oh, yeah, what mother doesn't know, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah, that was him. And he was funny. I, I remember when I was first starting smoking cigarettes when I was 11. And myself and about five of my buddies went down to the movie and we were in the balcony, and we were being bad, disruptive 11-year-olds. And you could smoke in the balcony, and we were smoking and everything. And as we're leaving, I see this kid lean out from another, from like one section away from me, and it's George. <laughs> and I'm, I'm 11, so he's about six. In a little wow. short half. Yeah. And he looks, and my mother is next to him, and she's just looking straight ahead. But he looks back to where I am, and he takes his fingers like he's smoking the cigarette, you know? And he goes, yeah. And he makes the signal that I've been caught smoking. <laughs> yeah, so I knew, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I knew what was happening that night. And I came home, and I was 11, getting ready to go into eighth grade because uh, I had got moved ahead of one class when I got kicked out of uh, – second grade for being an a-hole and uh, they they said yeah well i was not a nice kid and uh they sent me away to boarding school and boarding school only took you from third grade up so they said well move him ahead it's all right his marks are good he just don't know how to behave 
And yeah. some shriek said I was a bad boy. That was nice. And uh, <laughs> I never tried to be a good boy. And I never tried to be a bad boy. I was just naturally bad news to teachers, you know. And uh, George was the same thing. And he got kicked out of eighth grade uh, for going through wallets of a visiting basketball team in the oh, locker what? room. Yeah. And so they sent him to some school, kind of like the boarding school I was at. But he got kicked out of there quick because he broke up an art gum eraser and colored it blue or something and put it in a little plastic box and told some kid it was heroin. And that, that was that was the end of George. And they, they'd they only take him back in eighth grade if he would write the class play. <laughs> is that, I mean, is that values? Yeah, the kid can come back, but he's got to write the class play. Which he did. And the, the, well, the thing was, as, as you know, I don't think I've given you a big scoop. Uh, many, many, many bright kids should not be in school. You know, they, they should be doing something else where they can still learn. Uh, I mean, I went into first grade. I was five years old or six years old. I knew how to count. I knew the alphabet. I could read the comics. I knew five pennies made a nickel. Uh, and but all I got was sit still, keep quiet, don't mm-hmm. move around, and from the nuns, you know. And I'm not going for that. I'm not going for that. And their punishments were who cares, you know. You can take mm-hmm. those punishments. And uh, luckily, uh, if you're if you're lucky, you don't knuckle under. If you're lucky, you you stay free as George and I did. It's 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 wonderful not to have been bent out of shape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and uh, and that's you guys were all about fun, you know. Whether it was right or not, you you always enjoyed life, even as young as you were, and throughout life. And that, you know, that really is the secret to life: is just enjoying it and enjoying what you do. And um, you know, because there's so many things we have to do, but when you can do what you want to do and and be happy about that, that's oh that's, yeah, that's a good thing, you know. Oh yeah, and you gotta never whine. You gotta never whine when you're getting what's coming to you for acting up. You know. That's right. If, if I want to kick that kid in the shins when I'm playing soccer on Tuesday, and the brother is looking right at me, and I do it anyway, and I'm going to get ten on each hand from the leather strap on Friday. When it comes Friday, I'm ready for it, and I'm looking mm-hmm. right at him with that same look in my eye that. You ain't doing nothing to me that I can't handle. And uh, yeah. then you're cool. That's part of being cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, you, you had an Ed Sullivan show experience, you and George. And it's my understanding that you went on the show with him just on a whim. How did that happen? Talk about oh, that. The, number one, that's George having huge huevos is number one, and number two is me having total confidence in George. And what happened was we were living out there in uh, suburbia, nice little place, sheep would graze next to us and all that kind of stuff. And George was out there, and we were having a nice weekend, and he was writing a thing called Councilman Carl K. Copout, all with K's, KKK. And uh, it was around that year when the Democrats must have run about 30 people. It was a bad year for them. And uh, they had them all coming in from everywhere. So he wrote this thing. And when we got done, he had a clipboard. And I would ask him some questions like, uh, well, what do you think about uh, open housing, uh, Councilman Cop out? And he'd say, like, well, I prefer a roof myself, but you never know about so and so. And he goes, oh, I want to do this and that. And he gets done. And when he's leaving, he says, you know, you ought to come back and do the Ed Sullivan show with me. I'm a car salesman, remember. I'm just selling cars out there, not bothering no one. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, if I use a guy from equity, I got to use a guy from equity anyway. He said, why don't you come back? We'll have a nice trip to New York and then you can be on the Ed Sullivan show with me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I thought, I said, this guy's goofy. This guy's loco, man. And I said, all right, let's do it. 
So I held out. I said, I said, well, I'll go. I said, but you, if you got to buy me a sport coat. And he said, all right, man. He said, I'll take you to Cy DeVores. That was like a big name by Hollywood and Vine or something like that. And he bought me a nice emerald green. Uh, I picked out the color and all. because I would wear wild stuff, and George liked that. He always said, he said, I'm the rapier, Patrick, but you're the sledgehammer, man. And uh, he, he liked the fact that I was a little bent, you know. So anyway, mm-hmm. we get this green coat, and we go back, and we do a thing. We do a warm-up at uh, the Playboy Club, and we followed uh, Dr. Irwin, uh, Professor Irwin Corey, who's still around and who I still love, man. And the guy was there, and he's doing his thing, and I guess uh, a couple of guys with buzz cuts, you know, those little crew cut looking guys. Yeah. Uh, I guess they must have said something to him. And the next thing I know, he's off the lectern and chasing these guys in the Playboy Club and calling them dirty Nazis and stuff. So <laughs> Chris and I broke up. And then we went up and we did our thing. And uh, it was just wonderful and it was relaxed and everything. And I knew, I said, well, man, if I do something dumb or I do something wrong, I said, this guy's a comedian. I said, so he'll cover me, you know, it's like playing second base and you got the world's best shortstop there with you. And uh, we we get in there, we get to do the Ed Sullivan thing, and he had about 12 minutes, Dawn. He had 12 minutes of material. So oh, we went wow. back to, yeah, we went back to the old neighborhood and we smoked reefer all night long, man, all night long. And had a, we were listening to Sitting by the Dock of the Bay. It was a big, uh, big tune, man, Otis Redding. And that was on all the radios and all. And so we're doing that and everything. And we cruise down there. We do our first thing. And they cut it down from 12 minutes to 8 minutes. Then they cut it from 8 minutes to 4 minutes. And George <laughs> George didn't care. He said, hey, man, it, you know, they're just saving the best. It gets better and better. And I said, cool, cool, cool. And I just, you know, went along with whatever he said. And when it came time to do our thing, they had a big sign that co- would come down behind us. And it would say, meet the candidate. And that was done with a music cue. You'd hear this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm looking at this camera there, and I don't know, but I mean, I know a little bit about this and that. And I saw the red light come on, but I didn't hear a music cue. And my peripheral vision, I could see that nothing was coming. I said, George, the red light's on. He says, go, man, you know, without moving your lips. And he mm-hmm. says, go. He says, go, man. I said, oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Oker Van Sander, you know, instead of Sander Van Oker. And I'm here tonight. Uh-huh. And we just went and he did it. And everybody dug it. And uh, Ed was cool. He called us nice Irish boys or something. You know, he was kind of in a world of his own. God bless him. And, uh, yeah, that was the big night on Ed Sullivan. And a lot of fun. A lot, a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, George made it easy. Oh, gosh. Well, would you have ever imagined your life would lead you to some of these incredible places that you've seen? No. No. I really didn't. And I'm ashamed of myself <laughs> for for <laughs> taking the the lazy way. Uh, I mean, even my wife and I, we drifted into marriage. We drifted into it. You know how other people make all these preparations and they invite 400 people and blah, blah, blah. We just went out to the West Coast and got married on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, we had about, <laughs> I think we spent maybe 40 bucks. And uh, we had a few friends over from where we were working, and it was wonderful. And I don't think we've had a honeymoon yet. I don't think we've had a honeymoon yet. I, as far as we're concerned, we're on our honeymoon. That's what yeah, it is. that's right. Yeah. And like I told you, we've been on a honeymoon. Started, You've been on the honeymoon for nearly 50 years now, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because we take the line of least resistance, Dawn. We we do it the mm-hmm. easy way and at the last minute sometimes. And, I mean, I, I've quit jobs at 831 in the morning. 831. <laughs> I said, and have my check by 1030 or we're going to have big difficulties. And, uh, sure, then you go get another gig, you know. Yeah. And, uh, for that, you need you need the right kind of wife. You can't have a scared rabbit there saying, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to do our best to get by, and uh, we're going to see what... we keep getting we'll, it. Yeah, we'll see what unrolls. <laughs> now, I want to talk to you about um, your newest book, and, um, and it's a book of quotes and jokes and characters, poems and essays, 
And so are these all, as I like to call them, Patrickisms? Yes, yes. Good for you. <laughs> yes, they are. And they came about uh, over the years. Some of them are in there, and you'll see little little time zones on them, like 6606. I wrote a thing that day about, you know, the people that are scared of 666. Yeah. And so in going through these things, what it came about, about six months after George died, I was looking through my folders. I had many, many folders. I still have them. I've only culled them. I haven't really mm-hmm. gotten into stuff. I just took the very best I could get. Let me hit you with one little bit of how this step. It says, this is sure. like page four. It says, It's December 26, 2008, and I'm thinking about the coming year. I don't make New Year's resolutions, although I did throw my last pack of Luckies into the fireplace on January 1st, 1967, and say, no more of that blank. I never made a resolution. So I have just decided yesterday to go through my many folders of various trips from notes on yellow pads that have piled up over the years. It's an interesting compilation. That's all I'll say about its material. And then I'll tell you, what you do is you, you pick things out. I've got like 8905. I said, I've got nothing against spirituality and good vibes toward everyone. Jesus was like that. Jesus was a cool guy. He would have hung out on the corner with us, especially doing that water into wine trick. Pete the Painter, 47811 up above, and some of the guys who used to hang out drinking a jug of Muscatel or Tokay in Morningside Park would have loved him. Could you Mm -hmm. imagine Jesus in Vegas with Jerry Malone backing him at the crap table? And that was just a note that I had from that day. And then you got things that are like, well, this is uh, back to the couch. You know, guys who are getting analyzed. And then you have my favorite newspaper in there, the Daily Blank. And people on the Daily Blank, I said, I've got a newspaper city room up in my head, the kind they had in the old movies from the 30s and the early 40s. Mr. Romance is the relationships editor. Mr. Romance says, if you're not getting into her knickers, it's not much of a relationship. You have Alice in Wonderland. This is a lovely little girl. She crops up all through the book, you know. And Mm -hmm. she's in charge of gardening and organics and all things herbal. And she believes that hopelessness is not a bummer and wonders why when narcs make marijuana busts, they don't distribute the seized weed to needy hippies. Isn't that a nice girl? (laughs) And they have... (laughs) On the same fine newspaper, the Daily Blank, you have Senator Argo Stropmore, and he's retired. He handles political news. Stropmore retired during an ethics investigation in Congress. No ethics were found, and the senator became a freelance lobbyist and part-time columnist. That's columnist, not communist. There's not a speck (laughs) of red in the old senator. The American flag in his office has blue and white stripes. In his retirement speech, he told America how Washington works. Oh, and George loved this quote. George loved this quote. Doors will be closed. Cigars will be smoked. Brandy will be poured. Those outside the room will suffer. Ah, yes. And we have 47811 up above. He handles crime news. Now, I actually knew a guy who did this. 47 Mm -hmm. is his nickname. He's been up the river so many times that he dropped his regular name. Guys who know him just say, hey, 47, what's happening? And he says, one nice thing about being a felon is it gets you out of jury duty. Isn't that thoughtful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is very insightful. That is true. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I got a guy, Dominic Vobiscum, is on the same newspaper with them, the Daily Blank, and Dominic Fobiscum is the religion and entertainment news. He said, I got into religious reporting because I was already covering entertainment here at the <laughs> blank. And religion <laughs> seemed like a natural. For me, religion and entertainment go together like a dose of crabs and blue ointment. Let me say a word here about any of you halfwits out there who hate the Jews for whatever bizarre reasons you may harbor. You've got to give the Jews credit for one thing. 
They don't come around knocking on your door asking you to join their outfit. They don't ask you what you're doing for your soul or offer to share the secret of eternal salvation with you. I like that. And then you got another guy on the show is the the on-the-road guy, Frank the Wanderer. His initials are FTW, Dawn. You can work that one out in your spare time. Frank believes that life is about dealing with blank. He thinks of rules as flexible guidelines and would never let a rule get in the way of having a little fun. So what happened was, as I got these various quotes from the folders, some of them would almost scream out to go with a certain character. Oh, and wow. that's how the book that's how the book began to get together. And I can tell you that you know the little you know the little uh school story I told you about the kitchen? Yes. Okay. Now this this didn't really happen there, but this is a nice loose school that came up with the idea from that. This is an advertisement for the reality school for the recalcitrant. And here's the page. <laughs> it's from Jumbo Casey, the headmaster. He says, at the reality school for the recalcitrant, we educate the disenchanted. The reality school is for parents who have given up. Parents of means who have seen your offspring drummed out of the finest New England prep schools for various drug offenses and poor study habits. Parents whose children may have been arrested for breaking and entering, grand theft auto, manslaughter, or other pranks. Your kids will love it at the reality school. And you parents will love it even more because it's a year-round school. Dad, no more Christmas and Easter vacations ruined for you and the new bride by having the kids show up for the holidays. Mom, (laughs) you and Armando don't have to cancel that cruise to the Greek islands because you have to find a summer camp for Debbie and Derek. They're already here at the reality school. If your kid has an IQ of 131 and a report card of straight Fs, he sounds like our kind of material. Our (laughs) courses include cross-country skiing, motorcycle repair, body piercing, knife fighting and karate, as well as herbal birth control, tattooing, and cultivation. For sports, (laughs) we offer frisbee, bonging out, horseback riding, and swimming down at Horse Pond behind the stables. Two of our senior girls made the All-American shoplifting team last year. They'll be visiting the Diamond Merchants of the Netherlands this summer with Mrs. Casey. Every year we lose a student or two. If kids don't fit in, they just kind of go away. That's reality at the old reality school. Send us your kid in a certified check for forty grand, and we'll take care of the rest. <laughs> I love it. Wouldn't you like to go to that school? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> now, dig it. I got, I got 68 things in this book that tell you the meaning of life. Mm. And here's just one of them. It says, life after life. Who knows? And afterlife is a fun thing to contemplate. Gods and demigods cavorting and copulating with mortals. Those were the days. Then came the heaven and hell idea. Kind of nice. All the people who've done you wrong in this life go and burn in a lake of fire forever while you sit in the clouds watching the antics of other humans, nipping down now and then as a ghost to blank with them. Sounds like fun. But just in case it's not that way, you better enjoy every blanking moment that you've got here on Earth. Because there's a slight possibility that this life or lifestyle that you are busy experiencing but not paying attention to may just be all there is. But what do I know? Wondering Willie Turner. That's one. Then you got one. You say, life is like driving. You got to go with the wheels you got. If the dude next to you has more horsepower, it means nothing. You've just got to outweasel them in traffic. In life, you're lucky if you're a stick shift and not an automatic trans. That's from Slick. Another <laughs> one says, life, don't make it too complicated. All you got to do is keep your dukes up and keep slugging. K.O. Collins, contender. <laughs> life is fun. <laughs> there, there are so many of these, you know. 
Life has only two purposes. Number one is to keep having birthdays. And number two is to make your mother proud of you. Anything more than that is a bonus. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I'm a sick dude, man. But uh, No, but, I, I think your words are, are point, I mean, just right on point because you show the incredible wisdom with that, that you know, classic Carlin humor, and I love it. But it's so very true. I mean, we really, you know, we get one trip around the sun in this life, and we better make the most of it because we get one life to, to experience it to the fullest. And, you know, and people often, um, when when people get to know me and they find out all that I do in my fair time, so to speak, they're like, wow, how do you do so much? And I said, you know, I get up every day, and I get everything I can out of that day, because I don't know if I will get up tomorrow. So Good for you. I, I do a lot of different things, and I think it makes some people's heads spin, but, you know, I love every second of it, and, and I think that's really what, what everyone should strive to do, and, and um, of course, I think I make some people tired when I tell them what I do and how busy I am, but I enjoy it, you know, You're... so it's... Uh, you're what you are. You're what you are. And you're blessed with the energy and take it out and use it because you might not be that way. It's just developing what you are and getting the most yeah. out of it. I admire you for that. That's what it's about, Dawn. That's so true. So true indeed. Now, if someone, if, if people want to pick up your latest book, where can they purchase it from? Uh, this this one is on. I have a website. I have an actual website with a lot of goofy stuff on it. Uh, it's uh, www dot patrick carlin dot com, and the book Perfect. is for sale there. T shirts are there, and uh, the other book, Highway Twenty Three, and Kian Blank and Subway are both on Amazon. Excellent, excellent. Well, I am definitely going to get your book because, I mean, I really appreciate you taking a few moments to read some of the excerpts from the book. It, it sounds like an incredible book. And, of course, it, you know, it, it makes you laugh. There's nothing that you guys have ever put out, you, George, or the whole clan have ever put, have ever done and not made us laugh. And, you know, I guess as I've, I've been one to enjoy George Carlin, you know, enjoyed him through the years, and, and um, I just, you know, all I can say to you both is, is thank you for the laughter. Thank you oh, for yeah. the, the wonderful memories and for, for giving folks a reason to laugh, you know, because laughter really is, um, they say variety is the spice of life, but I think laughter is the one of the main reasons why we live. You know, I believe without it. Without laughter, I do where would it. we be, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, really? And it, it's such a gift to, to have that. And like I say, it's like blue eyes or brown eyes, and it, it's you can't you can't question it. It's it's just there. And right. uh, George had that quality, and he had that quality to to transfer it to other people. And uh, it, it, it's just he was really tuned in. He was really tuned in, and uh, I appreciate it. My my life, as, as far as I'm concerned, is to. Like you say, I want to have as much fun every day as I can uh, without hurting anybody. And mm-hmm. if, you can, if you can do that, you're cool. You That's know, exactly and right. I tell you, I got, well, I got. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it, it's no wonder why you are considered the dude of dudes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were using that word so long ago. You know, back in the '40s and the '50s and all. And when it came around uh, later, we we had it from then. And I actually had a guy wonder uh, one time uh, why I was using it, and I had to refresh his brain a little bit to show him that that was a word back in 1951, and uh, it it had the same meaning, man. When when you were a dude, you were cool. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. that's right, cool dude. You know that kind of was the lingo <laughs> I grew up listening to, cool dude. So. Um, well, I must tell you, it has been such an honor and a treat to have you on our show tonight and just listen to you share stories about George and about your life and, and all the wonderful fun experiences. We can't leave that word out, fun. Humorous experiences that you've had, they're just too many to name. I mean, just I could listen to you talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, oh. And, <laughs> I mean, you're awesome. 
So the next the next time you write a book and it comes out, I would love to have you back on because I would love to hear all about it and, and catch up and and just have you tell some more wonderful stories for our listeners. Well, that'll be my pleasure. I'm right in the middle of a huge one right now, a huge one about the old neighborhood and about the bar that George hung out in. Only I oh. changed the name. I changed the name of the bar, and I, you know, and I gave all the characters different names, but. Many of the incidents that occur are uh, things that really happen, and it'll be a big old goofer. And, oh, wow. Uh, when, do you, when do you think you might have it out? Uh, I'm going to try and finish it up this year because all the hard stuff is done. I've got a chick in there doing tarot readings, and she goes to Himalaya, and she gets busted for running the stash house, and she's dating a one-eyed bartender. And uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's stuff for those with Bent minds. <laughs> oh, could I tell you one thing, Dawn? Please, yeah. if you can encourage any kids anywhere that are getting bad marks in school and stuff like that, get them into something else after school where they can be themselves and do something, whether it's mm-hmm. vocational or whatever it is, because there's nothing wrong with a lot of the kids that are getting bad marks other than the regimentation of the schools and that prison look of when you go in there and that conformity that they demand, and it's gotten worse. I mean, it was rotten when we were there, and it's just super rotten now because there's too many kids, and encourage them in their time away from school. Say, all right, you got 65 in Spanish. That's okay. You'll pick up more Spanish hanging out with Luis and Ramon down on the corner then you're going to pick up in school anyway. I learned yeah. all the good stuff. I learned all the good stuff from Puerto Rican buddies of mine and stuff. You know, that's the you learn mm-hmm. the important stuff. <laughs> and, that's uh, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. The stuff in school, leave that alone. Not unless you want to be a kid who's out discovering galaxies. There are kids that are into the other, and they should be encouraged. And the kids that are physical, I try to you know, I try to make them understand that that little frail dude. Don't be bullying him because that's the mm-hmm. dude who can show you tricks to do with the computer that will put money in your pocket. So that's right. So help one another. Help one another. Mm-hmm. He'll help you on this. You help him on that. And uh, school can be a good experience if you got the right buddies, you know. And you always uh, find definitely. the eight balls. You always find the weirds, man. My mother told me that when I joined the Air Force. She said, you're going to find the same kind of people that you found. I moved to this lovely neighborhood, and who did you find? The Hagens and Harnbys of Amsterdam Avenue. You went up in that beautiful boarding school. And and in other words, I always find these ones that she doesn't approve of. And then she (laughs) she said, I'd find the same thing in the Air Force, and she was right. Each time I'd go from one base to another, within two days, I knew all the guys who had lost a stripe or two and where to go through the hole in the fence when you're on restriction. I mean, we yes. do find each other, Dawn. <laughs> well, you know, and, and that's what has made your life so colorful, so rich. I think and, so. <laughs> uh, and it has given you plenty, plenty of memories that you shall never forget. And uh, and. Oh, we we just want to thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing your stories and, and you're you're just phenomenal. So um, good luck with the next book. Can't wait till it comes out. Would love to speak with you about it for sure when it when it's all done. So um, it's just been a real treat tonight to have you here. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine, Dawn. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Well, you have a great night, Patrick, and uh, we will be talking with you again. Okay. Thanks again. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, folks, you have just been listening to Patrick Carlin. Um, And, gosh, what an amazing interview. I, you know, this is one of the reasons why I love what I do so much, because you, you sit and you get to listen to someone like him who is just a true icon. I mean, when you think about anyone that has ever loved George Carlin and his humor and, you know, have watched him, endlessly, you know, in his time. Um, and then you hear his brother and you're just like, wow, you know, he he's an icon in his own right too. And just enjoy listening to his stories. And I do believe this is going to be one of those interviews that just kind of goes down the history books for me as being one of the most memorable. Um, and, you know, he is just so full of life and 
um, you know, I know people my own age that do not have do not have that much life about them as, as this man does. And, and quite inspiring, quite inspiring. But nonetheless, I hope that you laughed a lot as he was telling his stories and sharing his stories of he and George and and just his life. And, uh, and we will have him back. So if you're a George Carlin fan and a Patrick Carlin fan now, I might add, um, you know, please, I will let you know when we're going to have him back on. Um, and, again, if you want to order his latest book, which um, – I won't repeat the name. I think you kind of got it. (laughs) But needless to say, if you want to order his book, you can actually find that on Amazon. And um, and also... you can you can go to his website patrickcarlin dot com and he's got a whole packet of stuff on that site. It'll keep you entertained for hours. Trust me. And uh, so uh, that was a great interview, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, I had made the announcement last night on Twitter. We're shifting gears a little bit now. That uh, at the conclusion of our interview with Patrick Carlin tonight, I would be making a big announcement as to um, a special guest that we will have coming on our show from Days of Our Lives. And uh, and I'm very, very excited um, to share with you that, yes, we are going to have um, a guest from Days of Our Lives on our show Monday night. And, um, and so we are so very excited, and our special guest is going to be Miss Camilla Banis, who plays Gabby Hernandez on Days of Our Lives. It will be at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and she will be here. We will be talking with her about her current role on Days and her storyline, uh, because, you know, that's really ramped up right now with the pregnancy and, and the whole Nick um, <laughs> drama with Will. And it's going to be great so if you're Days fans. I would highly recommend that if you want to talk with her, we will be taking calls. But um, I would love for you to call in, but you would need to call in before we go live um, at 8.30 p.m. So if you can call in about 10 minutes early uh, so we can get you in the queue, we do expect there's going to be a lot of calls for her. Um, And so we would love to try to get as many calls as we can in the time frame that we have her. We have her for one hour. So we're going to interview her, and then we'll take some calls and as many calls as we can. And uh, if you want to call in, I'm going to go ahead and shout out the number three four seven nine four five six nine six five. So Days fans, get ready. We'll have her, Camilla Banis, who plays Gabby Hernandez, on our show Monday night, March 25th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And also, I'm not going to announce the name right now, but I will go ahead and tease you and tell you that also next week we have a very big star from General Hospital who will be on our show next Friday night. And uh, I'm not going to announce because I don't want it to take away from the excitement of the day's guest that we will be having on Monday, but I can tell you next Friday night, um, March 29th, we will be having a very big guest on our show from General Hospital at 7 p.m. Eastern, and it, and it is booked. So, and I'm not going to tell you if it's a he or she. You're just going to have to stay tuned. And so I will make that announcement Monday night after uh, the conclusion of our interview with Camilla. So uh, you'll just have to wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, just these little surprises, and we've got lots more guests that we are in the process of booking and have booked. And uh, so I can tell you April is going to be a very good month, guys. <laughs> so we hope that you will stick around and be with us. And, uh, and of course, um, my friend and colleague, Ms. Pam, she will be here with me for some of these, um, you know, and uh, I know you've heard me a lot on her show. Well, now she's going to, it's made that time. She's going to be hosting on my show with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, but it, it's been a great night. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, and I hope that you're excited that we're going to have um, Camilla Banis from Days with us on Monday night. And with that, I will say good night and uh, have a great weekend all. We will be right back here on Monday night, as you know. And enjoy your weekend. And uh, we'll talk again with you real soon. Take care all and good night. Tonight's show has been brought to you by... One taste of Main Street Cake Shop's baked from scratch custom-made cakes and cupcakes and you'll be hooked. 
Every cake is made to order with only the finest and freshest ingredients. This is no ordinary bakery. Cakes are never pre-made. Main Street Cake Shop is in demand, having provided cakes and cupcakes for numerous prestigious events, bridal fairs, and venues. Owned and operated by April Murray, she has garnered many awards for not only her exquisite cake designs, but also for their incredible taste. If you're looking for a cake for any occasion, or cupcakes in a variety of flavors, then Main Street Cake Shop is the place. Visit them on the web at MainStreetCakeShop.com. Thanks for listening to tonight's show. You can connect to Behind the Mic Radio on Twitter at BT Mike Radio and on Facebook at Behind the Mic Radio. Check out our website at BehindTheMicRadio.com. Also, follow us right here on Blog Talk Radio where you can stay up to date on all upcoming shows. Every episode is available for immediate download upon the conclusion of each broadcast and as always on iTunes. Thank you for joining us.